That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Elvis, the sixth film directed by Baz Luhrmann, uh, which premiered at the 2022 Cannes Film Festival and is being released courtesy of Warner Brothers uh, June 24th, 2022. I don't know much about Elvis, but whenever I think about Elvis, I think about Kathy Griffin doing a bit about how Clay Aiken's gay but before he was out, blah, blah, blah. Then she refers to gay Elvis as Felvis. So whenever I hear Elvis, I think Felvis. Anyway, Baz Luhrmann, I recently watched uh, Moulin Rouge. For the first time. The first time. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would actually watch it again because um, I like Ewan McGregor. Mm -hmm. And then I, I don't know that I've ever seen Romeo and Juliet. And is that the only, like, have I seen anything else by him? Uh, Strictly Ballroom was his first film. With uh, Vanessa Williams? No, Strictly Ballroom. Oh. What's the movie she's in where she's dancing? Uh, isn't that... Or that's like salsa dancing. Yes, I forget, oh. I'm forgetting the name of that. With uh, that singer Cheyenne, I think? Yes, from like 2004 or something like that. Um, Shout out to Vanessa Williams. Which I think that's, is that a remake too? Oh. Or is that the one with Jennifer Lopez and thinking and Richard Gere? There's a movie with Richard Gere and Jennifer Lopez. About dancing. That, that's a remake oh. of a foreign film. Anyway, uh, hit hot Australia with Nicole Kidman and Hugh Jackman, which you never saw. Uh, no. You didn't see The Great Gatsby? No. Uh, and you didn't watch The Get Down. But I do like that Netflix. song. Uh, a Little Party Never Hurt Nobody. Yes. yes you play that all the time. Uh, the Get Down with... Um, Yolanda Ross. It's on Netflix. Oh, the TV series. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Christina Aguilera has that song on the soundtrack I like. Mm -hmm. All right. This movie... Just straight out the gate, I'm going to say I liked how it looked, I liked the music, and I liked the guy playing Elvis. Austin, Elvis. Austin Butler. Yes. Okay, the basic story. It's just a sweeping biopic mm -hmm. uh, from like when he was little, growing up uh, around black people. In Mississippi. Mm -hmm. To uh, getting a record deal and making this music that is like R&B, gospel-tinged rock music, becoming very popular, and then... Um, all of the backlash because um, conservative people thought he was too, like, he was indecent. So he's told, you either go join the military and go overseas or you go to jail. So then he goes overseas and right before he's going to come back, his plan is he wants to be a serious dramatic actor. So we get a montage of him acting. And when I say, like, it's like a three minute montage explaining his acting career. Um, and then we sort of settle into him becoming kind of like passe when he decides he wants to put on like the biggest show ever and that's when he gets his Vegas residency. And so the final third of the film is that residency um, and then him dying. But the main character of the movie is not Felvis, it's Tom Hanks as Colonel... Tom Parker. Tom Park. Oh, it's Tom Parker? Mm -hmm. Oh. So Tom Hanks plays Colonel Tom Parker, who was Elvis's business manager. And the story's told from his perspective. He is the main character. Mm -hmm. um, and basically how he made Elvis, and how everyone thinks that he killed him, but really he was, like, he made him, like, they made each other. We can get into it. Um, that's basically it. Yeah, there you go. Uh Oh, well, I don't even know where to begin. I don't have notes, so why don't you start? Oh, okay. Well, you know, this is hardly the first time that we've seen a, a biopic or an attempted biopic uh, about Elvis Presley. Uh, my favorite version is John Carpenter's miniseries from 1979 starring Kurt Russell. Um, the, the backstory uh, of that interest, too, is Kurt Russell was a child star, and her first film was uh, It Happened at the, fair, at the State Fair, where he's a small child that kicks Elvis uh, in the shin which is repeated later on when Kurt Russell was in 3,000 Miles to Graceland as an Elvis impersonator. Anyway, John Carpenter directed that miniseries. Shelley Winters played his mother, uh, Susan Hubley as Priscilla, and uh, Pat Hingle as the Colonel. There's someone notable in Welcome to the Five and Dime, Jimmy, Jimmy Dean. Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean. Who is not Cher. Who is that? Karen Black, Sandy Dennis, uh, Kathy Bates. A guy, maybe? Oh, from the trans character from the guy from A Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two. Yes. Where is that coming from right now? I don't know. Okay. Uh, there was a 2005... It's like, it seems like every decade we have um, Elvis resurgences because there's that 2005 miniseries uh, with Jonathan Reese myers uh, There has been another television version of the, the Colonel's um, uh, control of him in 1993 where Bo Bridges played the Colonel. Um, there's a TV movie about called Elvis and Me that's 
deal specifically with Elvis and Priscilla. There's a movie about how he dated uh, a beauty pageant queen after his divorce from Priscilla. Uh, you could go on and on, really. What? But so my problem with this film is is it's. Uh, Baz Luhrmann doing what he only knows how to do is make a film that's completely just montage and using anachronistic music. And it, the whole film, it feels like we hardly get any time to breathe because it's all montage. Well, I definitely agree. Like, you know, it's two and a half hours. And I feel like the first half of the movie, I just felt delirious. Like, it's just breakneck speed. Nothing's being developed. It, it, it's beautiful to look at. The music's great. Uh, but it, it, there's just a lot happening. I don't know much about Elvis really at all. And, you know, I think the film's effective or it was effective in making me want to actually watch like, like research Elvis and watch actual performances and actual footage of him being interviewed. But There's yeah, there are so many important things in this man's life that the film hints at, but it doesn't develop. Like growing up around a bunch of black folks, mm -hmm. we get like an early montage of him like there's like a juke joint in his little hood and he's seeing like very sexual sort of like R&B type jazz blues music being performed and then like right across <laughs> like the same at the same time it like, collapses it. like a mirage there's this gospel setting where people are ca catching the, the Holy Ghost a and, revivalist tent yes yeah. so we get a little bit of that but we that probably is the thing that sort of irked me the most because I don't, I'm not a musical historian, so I don't, you know, people, my understanding of Elvis is that people think that he sort of stole his style from black artists. So if that is true, which I don't know, the film makes him seem like he just liked black people. Well, see, that's, okay, so that's the entry point. I think the other film's major problem is it glosses over all the problematic part parts of Elvis's life uh, as in taking away any kind of responsibility he might have had. Well, that. right. So even for someone like me who doesn't really know the facts, it, it it's being very vague. Like, it doesn't show that he either gave credit or what is his what has he done for black people because the movie just makes it seem like he just really likes black folks. Again, but, I, again, th this Baz but he's Lerman, not doing anything for them. Right. But Baz, and that's an interesting conversation too but Baz Luhrmann's film kind of paints him as this folk hero who crossed the color lines and while he did kind of integrate music and, and again, because of where he was influenced by, you know, it, sh it shows that he had a love for uh, Mahalia Jackson. Uh, yes, it. how much of an artist, especially in this period, do we want to hold them responsible for also bringing black people up? There's an Alice Walker short story that deals specifically with him kind of taking Hound Dog away from a musical artist uh, in, in kind of very vague, ambiguous terms, but that, that I think is worth reading. But. Well, this film does show a woman singing Hound Dog, and mm -hmm. then he says, I want to sing that. Mm -hmm. But he does it more like as an act of like he just covers defiance. It. Like, Well, yes. Okay. But but again, I was comparing him in our conversation after this to like Madonna and the ballroom scene in Vogue and how while she did probably speak up more for a community than Elvis did for specifically to or for the black community, um, you know, there were still some limitations there of, of, of appropriation. Yeah. I mean, all I can say is that this film doesn't really get into that. Or, like, except that we see him like on the day MLK is assassinated, that he seems bothered by it and then later on he says mlk spoke the truth so again and then he does say oh i i really love mahalia jackson i got to meet her i think he was they they uh, suggest that he was asked to sing at her funeral right but then he couldn't make it. it it reminds there's i know you don't like eminem and i'm not saying that i really care for him either but there's that line i kept thinking of from um i am i what's that uh I am the worst thing since Elvis Presley to use black music so selfishly used to get myself wealthy. <laughs> Another thing it doesn't delve into enough is when Elvis is in Germany, that's when he meets Priscilla. Oh yes, it who, glosses over that. Who um, is like the daughter of like a high ranking officer. And they don't say how old she is, they just say she's the teenage daughter and then we hear him say or allude to the fact that he's 10 years older than her, but that's later on in their lives. But... It's like she, would, she was a straight up teenager. It would seem met. that like she was a huge part of his life, but the film just has her kind of in the side. Like you, we see her a lot, but she's not doing anything. And then she has a baby. We don't really get much about that except after she leaves him. I mean, well, at the point where she leaves him, she says like, "You don't. When was the last time you spent any time with us? We've never like when was the last time we had dinner together as a family." The end. Then 
right before he dies, we see her meet him to like exchange their daughter for, you know, visitation, whatever. And she tries to do an intervention. Like, I have a rehab center in San Diego for you ready. Please go. And he doesn't. And then the next scene is he dies. But... And yes, she's played, Priscilla's played by Olivia DeJong, and not to discredit the actress's performance, but they really don't, there's, there's no room for Priscilla, as usual. Uh, I liked that lady. I don't know who that lady is, but I liked her, um, she's but in, she has nothing to do. No, nothing to do whatsoever. And then it also... I liked her little hairdo, too. <laughs> sure, well, Priscilla's classic look, but yeah. uh, it, it also really paints over his infidelity. It just kind of suggests it. That's and, the next thing. And it almost like blames his... Um, downfall almost entirely if not on tom parker but on uh pills yeah we only get allusion to it once when he's performing in his vegas residency and when he's done he's walking through the crowd and he's like kissing all these ladies on the lips <laughs> what i thought that what lerman was gonna do initially because uh and we we still haven't really addressed tom parker but he's from the carnival world and uh his early days with elvis that there's a, a sequence of um, they show Austin Butler leaning against a sign for a geek, mm -hmm. like Nightmare Alley, and I'm like, and I'm like, oh, I thought they were gonna really drive it home, home heavy how he made this man a geek. Well, he does keep saying like it's snow, like it's like a snow job and snow business is show business and like it's all fake and we got to make this character and, but then, I, I don't know what character he thinks he made because. Elvis is big. Elvis's style is what made him so popular, but Elvis had that style before he met the Colonel, and then the Colonel tries to make him family friendly and tells him wear like suits and don't move your hips. But then of course that's not what Elvis, you know, Elvis became the flashy gyrating man we all know. So it's like I don't know what character the Colonel thinks he made except that he set up all these business deals. I but, think uh, didn't Eldridge Cleaver made the comment about um how he woke the dead white pelvis. <laughs> yes. Then B.B. Uh, B. King is in the film, played by Calvin Harrison Jr. Correct. Mm -hmm. And I think those scenes work well because Elvis sort of seeks... I mean, anytime Elvis is... Uh, any Anytime he seems frustrated with his life, especially when he's in Graceland, he goes back... Well, even before then, because once he starts to become popular, he's able to move his family out of the ghetto... But he still goes back, but not to the area where he used to live. Beale Street. He goes to Beale Street, and then he's become friends with B.B. King, and then they commiserate. and They watch Little Richard perform. Which I liked. I, I thought that was good. And then we get another woman singing who is amazing, and she's the one who we see. Isn't that we, Yola? We see singing Hound Dog. Um, I, gosh, I wish, so, oh, there's so much I want to talk about, but. I wish this film would have been two things. I wish it either would have focused on his relationship with black people and the gospel and R&B that influenced him and his upbringing. Like, I almost wish the film would have been like him as a young adult, like, like an adolescent and teenager right before he hit it big and what made Elvis who he is. Or it should have been that five-year period when he had like the show in Vegas mm -hmm. and he was so huge. Mm -hmm. But... I, I think we need to talk about the colonel. I, well, I want to talk about his mother first. I think they kind of downplay her because that was a nice, interesting relationship he had with her. Because, of course, Elvis was born a twin and his twin brother died. And his mother kind of already, always kind of manipulated him a bit and placed that, that, tra that trauma was always over, hanging over them, this family. And they're, they're very kind of a, a superstitious kind of family as well. Um, but, his, but then the mom dies while he's in the military... But she's here played by Helen Thompson, an Australian actress, and that is not what Helen Thompson looks like at all, which is really interesting. And um, they paint her so crazy. To me, they make her look like that woman in the music video for Devo's Whip It. You'll have to look up what I'm talking about. She that kind of reminded me of that lady from the movie Flux Gourmet. Gwendolyn Christie? Yeah, because her, her foundation is like two shades lighter than her actual skin tone. And it's very like deliberate. And then she had those eyebrows. And then she had those like 1930s pencils. That Jean Harlow eyebrow, yeah. Yeah, so it's such, such an interesting representation to not have it go anywhere. And then she just dies. And that, Yeah, uh, but so I, I think that they downplayed that. I really could have done, I think you can't talk about Elvis without the Colonel also because he's such an integral uh figure in the trajectory of Elvis, but Tom Hanks... <sighs> First of all, he looks like a villain in... He, they the, don't, they don't, the way he's done up, he could have been a villain in like the 
two Dick or ninety Dick Tracy movie. They don't humanize him at all, which doesn't help. Uh, so he seems like uh, my other problem with Tom Hanks is especially considering Chet Hanks, because now, you know, they're doing the press for Elvis and Tom Hanks is talking about how, oh, he couldn't play the character of Philadelphia in Philadelphia now because it wouldn't be appropriate because he's not a homosexual, which I, I, I disagree with that sentiment. I think we have a representation problem, but I do think as actors, they should have liberty to play, you know, all kinds of different people, really. Uh, but it's like, well, then you shouldn't have played this character who is both older than you, overweight, and uh, from Dutch. Dutch, from a country whose accent you cannot master, sir. So It's distracting because, well, also because the colonel, well, from when we meet him until he dies, he's fat and ugly. So they could have just found a old ugly, fat Dutch man to play this character because there's no transformation. Well, because so, <laughs> the, I think the brilliance of casting Austin Butler, who we don't know as well, although I do remember as Tex Watson, now that I looked that up, but uh, in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, is you're able to be transported into his performance, which I think is really good. And I he think you, that he should have done the same with the Colonel, somebody that we don't know because it's yeah. so distracting watching Tom Hanks and his accent blunder and, through that. Oh my gosh, it's it, it's. I'm sure people don't agree, but I thought it was pretty bad. I think it's really bad. It's, he's using this it's hul- definitely distracting. halting speech thing. Yeah. It's always distracting. Every time he's on screen, I'm like, oh, go away. The people who did the makeup did a fine job. But, sure. So I'm not saying it's bad makeup. It just He just looks... It's like the same makeup that they did for Al Pacino and Dick Tracy. Like He just looks so... <laughs> like it's clearly Al Pacino under this makeup. That's how it feels with this character. And it just took me out. Well, I don't think it's subversive enough to, tr- like, to try to make the audience think that he's an innocent in this. <laughs> Okay, that's what I want to talk about. I think it's a very, it could have been made for a very interesting story to, as the audience, the problem with the way this character is presented is he literally looks like a comic book villain. So the entire film, you're just disgusted by him until the end when Elvis finally, like at the breaking point, because Elvis learns that the colonel is not a damn colonel. He's not a U.S. citizen. He doesn't have a damn passport. And the reason the colonel has been manipulating Elvis's career such that Elvis never left the country, besides going to the military, is because that fool is... The colonel has assumed a fake identity and has no passport. He can't travel. He has a gambling addiction. He has a gambling addiction. And that's how Elvis ended up at the Las Vegas hotel because the owner agreed to like settle all of the colonel's debts if they could get Elvis there. Mm-hmm. So once Elvis learns that... He's like, you're done. And that scene when Elvis is ready to like hop in his Cadillac and get on a plane and go overseas, the colonel tells him like, you know, yes, I have like taken from you. Not unlike all these leeches around you who just take, take, take and do nothing for you. I made you who you are, just like how you made me. We are the same. Like we did this for each other. And then you're like, Yeah, that's a greedy motherfucker, but he's not lying. So I wish that had a different actor played this character and not been made to seem like a comic book villain, I think it would have been so effective for the audience to feel conflicted. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, the typical Hollywood story is that artists are taken advantage of. But in this instance, this is the king of rock and roll and has made his estate is worth hundreds of millions of dollars and he will forever be an icon. Like, clearly this man did something for him. They did something for each other. And as far as the film tells it, because I don't know much about Elvis, he didn't seem to have a lot of business acumen. So this man really did build his career. But because Tom Hanks is doing like this character this way, it just... It again, and it also glosses over kind of you know he he was uh, in his own little world in the seventies, which probably was because of the, the the drugs and the fame as well. But you know it skips over that notable moment where uh, Elvis makes it a point to go talk to Richard Nixon at the White House, of which there's a really dumb movie version with Kevin Spacey as Nixon and Michael Shannon looking like E.T. as Elvis. Um, that doesn't work. Uh, that doesn't work at all, but not unlike like Kanye going to talk to Donald Trump. It's like, who are wow. you? It, it goes over how he's kind of really for an older generation, even as he's going through this revamp in the 70s. Okay, we need to end this video, I think. But I think the sense I got from this film is... Baz Luhrmann got the blessing of like Priscilla Presley and she probably consulted for this film and they didn't want to show Elvis in a negative light. So they kept all the crunchy bits out and just sort of sort of showed his struggle. And I'm sure she didn't want to highlight her relationship with him. And that's why we don't get a lot. Um, So it doesn't feel like gritty like I think it should. 
for someone who like didn't he die on the toilet? Like, I mean, it just seems that's like... A, that's a rumor. I don't know. Is it, I, don't I, don't know, know. I, don't know. I don't know if that's but true. But his actually. demise, I mean, his early demise is clearly, um, you know, not glossy. I mean... Oh, dying at the age of 42, the way he looked. It, it, like, Because the terrible. film doesn't even show him looking bad. Austin Butler His very final performance, yeah. they put, like, fat makeup on him, but we never see him standing up. So, Austin Butler, that's that man's name, mm-hmm. he looks good for the entire movie, really. But we know Elvis fell off towards the end right well they do show him singing the righteous brothers unchained melody which was i really liked that yeah. how i did really like the f- sentiment of where it did the note it ended on and it shows him the actual elvis singing. they do that like four times throughout the film where they mix actual footage with yeah. austin and it's seamless yeah yeah, yeah. No, it, that looked pretty good mm-hmm. but it but again they the last scene he has with priscilla you know they have we hear sound bites of the press saying like oh his waist band is expanding but austin butler looks exactly the same yeah. uh, as a, a thin man and t- but talking about how he was supposed to be in a, a, a star is born the barbara streisand film version which of course would instead star chris christopherson but what an interesting uh yeah. idea that would be but i also really dislike how it skips over his considerable uh hollywood career in, in films oh that's and right they don't even say any titles of anything but like not like you know clam baker <laughs> yes that's important because we hear felvis like we hear him say my dream is to be a dramatic actor he wants to be james dean yeah. yes he, he says it multiple times so it's like that's a major like plot point in this individual's life and then we just get like a three minute montage of him and it's like multiple like the screen is split with like different roles he was in and it's sort of drama t- dramatized to like him being in anguish from other things that are happening in the world and i just think like that part of his life deserved more attention because we hear the character saying how much it meant to him. Right. Yeah. No, <laughs> like, I agree. It, it, again, I think the problem is we get so much montage. There's really no room for like the human Elvis. But I want to end on a positive note because I do think that Austin Butler was captivating as Elvis. I think the best scene in the film is um, when he's preparing for his Vegas show the preparation of him working with the band and the singers and him doing his dancing and then we hear him perform a song and i thought that was really amazing oh that was good it it felt big oh yeah and then it felt expensive and then we get suspicious minds you know yes Mm -hmm. so that was definitely a highlight i think this movie was okay i would definitely recommend it for someone like me who doesn't know elvis i think it'll be you know and somewhat of an education it would spark interest in further research and for people who are fans i obviously you should watch it Mm-hmm. There's a 1981 documentary called This Is Elvis, which has a lot of real footage of him. I don't know if his music's on Apple Music, but I, I definitely, my next little road trip would I know play. I know Suspicious Minds is, because I have played oh. that regularly. But uh, He has a beautiful, I, I didn't realize he had such a nice voice. Really? Yeah. No, no yeah. I mean, it's even, you know, because I'm not that familiar with his discography, but it's funny when you hear bits and pieces, it's like, oh yeah, he, he was known for that. Honestly, for that. I don't think I even knew what Elvis looked like, except he wore like the white jump. And the only reason I know that is because I attended that Britney Spears concert back in 1999, where she wore the white jumpsuit and she was plastered across the MGM. Mm-hmm. And then everyone was saying that's an ode to Elvis. So when I think of Elvis, I think of the white jumpsuit. Oh yeah, because... And the dark, dark hair. Yes. But when they show footage of him as a young man oh, he's I don't, very handsome. I didn't realize that's what he looked like yeah yeah they, they you do hear well doesn't toxic sample um one of his songs yeah because yeah. you hear well you know how baz lerman likes to blend anachronisms and because uh, yeah, yeah. you hear in sync and you hear and, and then doja cat has a song which i really like but it felt a little strange to me that that was in, yeah. like it feels unnecessary this is your it takes it's you, a good song it, it is a great song but it takes you out of the period that we're in and i i, I, I guess this uh, but that's his style, right? Every movie's like that. I, I guess in making a comment or trying to connect with contemporary audiences about celebrity and the making of that, but you don't need that with somebody like Elvis. Just like you don't need Tom Hanks to star in this film because the story's going to sell itself. It's about Elvis. Okay, what else you got? That's it. What would you give it? Two out of five. I would give it two and a half out of five. I've seen it twice. Two out of five. Okay. Uh, hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. Bye.